listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. I am back after a little break to visit family in the States, uh, and I expected to come right back to the show, but I returned to Paris to get knocked out with COVID for a week. Now I'm sounding more like myself and ready to record new interviews for the remainder of season five. So thanks for your patience and sorry about that little absence. To kick things back off, I'm joined today by someone with a mission to fill in the gaps where French authorities fall alarmingly short. Chrisandra Heslop is the co-founder of the nonprofit called Soul Food, an organization that began in 2018 to expose migrant youth to cultural events and artistic environments, meals and language activities all in an effort to provide intellectual and cultural stimulation, facilitate positive integration experiences, and encourage novel levels of autonomy in their new home country. On top of that, they also create opportunities for cultural exchange between migrant youth and local French teenagers. Chrisandra joins me today to talk about building this mission, who she and her co-founder are helping, and the challenges specific to carrying out this project in France. Cassandra, so nice to have you. Thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Um, so, you know, Soul Food Paris, it's a nonprofit. It's been, from what I understand, your big baby for the last handful of years. Can you give a little bit of broader background on who you are and, you know, what brought you to France, what you were doing before launching this this organization, um, because I think there's a lot out there about the organization, but not so much about what you were doing before. <laughs> sure. So I was born in New York City. Um, my dad is from Panama and my mom is Italian American. So, yeah. <laughs> so I wow. lived in different places. <laughs> yeah. So I lived in different places within the U.S. My family's quite spread out, but I also lived in Panama and Italy before moving to Paris almost 11 years ago now. Um, and yeah, in, in the States, I studied uh, psychology and also Italian and art history. And then here in Paris, I studied international relations and diplomacy, mm. just kind of when I started to get deeper into issues that involve uh, young migrants and uh, refugees. And so before you launched uh, Soul Food, were you already working within that that world of you know not not necessarily philanthropy but certainly nonprofit helping uh individuals who are you know in coming coming through Europe or coming through France with difficult circumstances yes um so before i was a bit more focused on psychology so i was working with uh, children and young people with disabilities and severe uh, behavioral disorders I did some volunteer work as well with malnourished uh, children, but I was always interested in multicultural issues. So I enjoyed doing that work a lot. But uh, I think when it came to like research and writing, I was kind of uh, slowly making my way more towards the population I work with now, I would say. Um, and so before Soul Food started, I was volunteering for a while in Paris with unaccompanied minors mostly and also other young um, migrants and refugees. Were you, was your family involved in this kind of work as well? Um, like, did you have a, like, what drew you to this um, very important work? I mean, we need more people, obviously, who are, who are involved in, in, in helping uh, people with these circumstances. But, you know, was this something like when you were a kid, you kind of knew you were going to be involved? I don't I didn't know I would be involved with migrants and refugees. I was always interested in working with kids and helping kids to be honest sounds a bit <laughs> cliched or corny maybe but I was always interested in that. I definitely have parents who raised me with a strong moral backbone. So I don't think I was ever going to do something that didn't involve helping others if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, but, <laughs> but um, and then I would say in my own multicultural background that comes from my parents and my grandparents and great grandparents is really what uh, probably sparked my interest in learning about other cultures and traveling and learning different languages. And then really what I don't think we, I realized it necessarily at the very beginning, but really what we're doing with soul food, it kind of, involves all of those things, everything from, 
you know, speaking different languages to art history, psychology, international relations. It kind of involves all of it. So, um, yeah, I think all of those different things that I sort of grew up around and then that I was interested in as a teenager and a young adult, I think it's all kind of fed into soul food. Mm. So what was the catalyst then for this particular organization? Um, you have a co-founder who is French. Um, you know, how did you two envision the project? And, you know, how does that differ from, you know, day one, what you thought you were going to set out to do and to now what you've been able to achieve? So uh, Francois, the other co-founder and I, we were volunteering for a few years with unaccompanied minors. At one point, he started volunteering with me. He's a legal counsel. So our um, we were doing more uh, legal help um, and uh, basically helping unaccompanied minors navigate the French administrative system so that they could benefit from their rights as minors in France. Um, so our we started volunteering together, and our backgrounds complement each other pretty well, I think, in that kind of work. Um, and he's also a musician in an Afrobeat band called Bim Bam Orchestra. And so after a few years of volunteering, we got to know a few of these young people pretty well. And we also, I would say, had a better understanding, like holistically, of their situation and what was really missing and where we could fit in because some of the things that are missing, you know, are on, on a more institutional level. Um, but we understood that we could do things to help them fill in the, these huge gaps of time when they aren't really allowed to do anything um, with something constructive, uh, creative, inspirational. And so Soul Food really started organically. Uh, the very first cultural excursion we did was take them to see one of his concerts. So um, quite a, so nat yeah, was, a natural extension. Yeah. And at the time we weren't calling it soul food. We, we just thought like, why not do this? It would be really great for them. And, uh, you know, because he was in the band, we were able to get tickets for free. So that wasn't an issue. Um, and it, it went really well. Uh, we, there were some young people in the beginning who were a bit more shy or reserved. It was the first time they had been to something like that to this kind of concert in a, you know, like in a proper venue. And, um, but by the end of the night, they were, everybody was dancing. It was, it was really quite um, moving. And so we thought, well, why not do this again and, and bring new young people? And, and um, you know, we, Francois, he has a, like a, a network of musicians within the city. So we were able to do a few more concerts. And then we thought, why not also go to a museum? Like the first Sunday of the month, they're free. And these are things, again, that we were already doing on our own as well. So we thought, why not integrate them into this? We find this to be like a good way to take a break and to find inspiration. So maybe they will too. Um, and that went really well as, as well. Um, then not too long after, we met we met our first uh, partners, the, the Refetorio. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. that, that was our first partner, and that's still been one of our strongest um uh, partnerships and so we started to go there to eat amazing amazing uh, food and yeah so then it just kind of kept going and we started talking about uh, names and and what else we could do and so the first excursion was in February and by the fall we were uh, you know sitting down to have more sort of serious meetings about what we might want the mission statement to be and the vision and you know some of the more creative aspects the branding and all of that Mm -hmm. um, and, and for those who uh, yeah, don't so know, I, what is what is re refetorio? Uh, so it's a um, a cultural project. It was started by Massimo Bottura, an Italian chef. So there are quite a few around the world, and actually they're they're growing a lot. There are a lot more opening. Um, and the idea is that everyone should have access to good. Uh, beautiful food and cultural experiences. So they use, and but they're also very um, great about using food that would have otherwise been wasted. Um, so basically, uh, when you go there, you have to be with uh, an association. Mm -hmm. um, like you can't just pay to go there to eat. So we, we're, we eat there for free. Um, and uh, they invite, sometimes they invite guest chefs. So sometimes you, you might have a meal from a Michelin star chef even. Um, but the idea is that each meal is uh, 
like a gastronomic meal with at least three courses, sometimes even more. Um, it's all made with food that would have otherwise been wasted. So each night the meal is different. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there are musicians and artists who also come to perform. So it's it's really a, a beautiful uh, cultural and solidarity uh, project. Um, there are a lot of volunteers there. The team is quite small. So anybody can go and volunteer either to serve or to work in the kitchen. So we've actually sent a lot of our young members there to volunteer in the kitchen with um, Maxime and the other chefs. Um, so yeah, and this it's, is it's a this very is at the place. this is at the Eglise de de la Madeleine, right? Yeah, it's in the crypt of the Madeleine. Uh, I mean, so that's yeah. incredible. So okay, so you had this early partner, um, and that's where sort of the food experiences also developed, perhaps more, more you know further than you maybe had imagined in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's for, And for a while, that was the main food experience. And then at a certain point, we, we thought, okay, this is really great that we are able to create these moments where these young people can kind of take a break and stop worrying about their problems and hopefully feel inspired and even um, like express themselves creatively because we also do workshops and different things like that where they can also create art, not only observe art. But we wanted to find a way to help them more long term. And so that's why we started the professional development program. Um, and it's really geared towards our young members who are interested in careers in culture. So the culinary arts was really the first one that we focused on. Um, so young people who want to work in restaurants to become chefs or work in bakeries or become pastry chefs. And we met our first partners in that program, I believe, through the refectorio. And then also the fact that they could go and work in the kitchen in the refectorio for a day or two days or three days. It also helps already to give them a first experience. It helps them to also be able to test it because these young people, they aren't they don't have the same opportunities as maybe you or I had to, you know, test something and decide, oh, no, actually, this isn't for me. Sure. And we, you know, we think that's really important. We all have, most of us at least, have to work for the majority of our lives. So it's important that we have jobs that we enjoy. Uh -huh. um, and then the the great thing is that through the refectorio, um, we're able to meet partners who are really um who have meaningful projects and who are engaged at some level. Um, so that's important to us too, because we, we only want to work with people who, you know, are going to be somewhat sensitive to the situations our young members are in and also who are trying to do things too, like, like just like the refectorio to help with um, sustainability issues or maybe something else, you know, representation, um, stuff like that. So one of the other partners I've seen you work with is Stéphane Jego of La Mijon. Um, what, like, what are, what is the, uh, what are the parameters of that partnership? It, you know, does he cook with them? Does he offer um, sort of training? Does he offer them employment opportunities? Like, what does that look like? So. Basically, when we have partners in the professional development program, the idea is that our young members can, at the very least, um, do an internship, like a stage d'observation with them for, um, usually that lasts about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, then if the the partner has, um, for example, space in, in his or her kitchen, the ideal scenario is that they would then be able to sign an apprenticeship contract. Um, and this gives them usually about two years of a good experience and also um, this so this helps with on their CV as a as a professional experience this also helps a lot though when they have to go to the prefecture for their um, documents um, to have a titre de séjour it it looks obviously like way better on a CV but also for the you know authorities the administrative authorities to be able to say that you're working in a um, prestigious or reputable restaurant versus like fast food restaurant. Um, and so then the idea is that just when they're there, that they're really taken in as, as part of the team. Um, Soul Food handles all of the sort of liaisons between maybe the um, the French child services or the, the education 
uh, factor, like the whether it's the teacher, the educatrice, these these kind of things. It depends. Different young members have different situations. Some of them are also based on banlieue, so maybe they, you know, it can it can differ um, depending on where they are. But um, we really help a lot with all of that and all of the administrative stuff, making those connections, so that the the partner can really just focus on the professional aspect. Um, so then when a young soul food member is working in a kitchen, like at La Mijon, it's really just, you know, he is an intern or an apprentice, just like any other intern or apprentice. Um, and then we try to maintain uh, regular contacts with our partners just to check in, make sure everything is okay. You know, some of our young members have maybe some kind of particular need or they've all been through different forms of trauma, but some of them are maybe still going through it. So we try to really do everything we can to support the young member, but also the partner and, you know, really um, make that a, a comfortable and productive situation for everyone. Yeah, I was wondering um, at what point your journey or their journey rather um, connects with you. And so in some cases, I imagine maybe not all of them, these are young people who have um, who you meet once they've been sort of welcomed in by a different, um, I guess you were saying French social social services. Um, but are you also connecting that with them before any of the other sort of organisms uh, that might be involved in their experience? So because of where we used to volunteer, we, um, we were meeting before a lot of these young people right when they arrived. Um, so we used to volunteer at a place called Aji, and there the, the main mission is, is helping with the administrative stuff. But um, we would meet uh, unaccompanied minors as they were arriving in France and, and help them with that, but also uh, send them to other nonprofits and organizations if they had medical issues or different things like this. And um, so with Soul Food, Typically, like most most soul food members are more in more stable situations. Um, we, you know, we try to be sensitive and we understand that everything has its time. So for a young person who is still sleeping on the street, like just arrived, it's not the best moment to propose going to a museum. So, you know, most of our young members are at least relatively more stable. That being said, we have had young members before who were still more in that early stage and who told us, no, but I want to come. It's, it's, uh, I need that. That will help me. Um, so wow. we have had this situation before where we all go out to a concert and then we know that, you know, one young member is going to be sleeping maybe outside the venue that night. Um, but most of them, it, they're in more stable situations. So uh, most young soul food members are, um, they have been here for a while, and maybe one to two years at least, and then some a little bit longer. Um, they're between the ages of 14 and 22, but um, the average are 16 to 19, I would say. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Sorry. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually that leads me into another question, which is sort of, you know, there's a lot of talk um, globally about migrants and, 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 you know, the U.S. will constantly look at what's happening in Europe and Europe looks at what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, but regardless, this is sort of an, uh, a natural expected um, pattern, right? Climate change is part of it, war zones, you know, uh, dictatorships. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why people would flee. So in your experience, how does France rank or, or sort of measure up in terms of the treatment uh, and ease of in integration for migrants? Because, you know, depending on what you're reading, you're seeing different things. And, you know, historically, you've seen that people have tried to sort of bypass France to go to England for a number of reasons. Now, maybe that's because of language, or, you know, some people have reported that it's because of the way they're treated in France. So, you know, sort of what is your observation on, on France in this in their work with uh, welcoming and addressing migrants? I would say that it's not great, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm, you know, there are countries that are worse, but there are also countries that are better. And considering 
I think sometimes it's hard to to um, talk about it in France or to understand it when we also have this other side of of this France that's very glamorized and that and that people imagine with the ideals and you know brotherhood and equality and so it's it's very it's a contrast um, and that's really too bad but yeah so I would say in general that it's not great uh, so again at this at when we see these young these unaccompanied minors when they're first arriving the majority of them or at least the ones that we've worked with are spending time, for example, experiencing homelessness, which they shouldn't be. Um, France still uses outdated bone tests to to uh, try and assess a- their age. Um, the waiting periods are just insane. And once again, when they're waiting, they're not permitted to go to school. Uh, they're not even allowed to participate in official activities like joining a football uh, club. Um, also, even for those, we work a bit less with asylum seekers and refugees, but even for those, you know, we've we've seen some who their their stories are are just devastating, and um, it's it's incredibly obvious that they uh, their asylum claim should be accepted. But it's not, or if it is, it's accepted way later. Um, there's a lot of things too like that that happen that, you know, it, it seems very often like judges wait until the last minute before they accept things because then that um, changes everything. Unfortunately for them, it like uh, turning 18, it's not like the same celebration that maybe it would be for other people. Um, so we've seen a lot of cases of, of uh, young people whose claims or whose minority status are accepted so late that then it's really hard to do anything with that. Or then it has negative implications, um, for example, for them to be able to help their uh, family because, you know, there's like different laws like that. Like if you are uh, accepted as a refugee under the age of 18, and you have, um, for example, I, we work with someone who who was in this situation and whose um, mother and little brother is are still in danger. But because they waited until after he was 18 to s- accept his claim, he can't really do anything about it. So because if they had to... because if they had done something when he was still a minor, it what like accelerates or allows for different then rights he... for the family. Yeah, they would have. Um, uh, been more likely to to fall under family reunification. Uh, okay. So there's a lot of things like this that happen, and sometimes it's a bit difficult to um, even like categorize, or you know, it, sometimes it's quite subtle, and it's even difficult to um, refute or like to fight against in a way because you know, at that point, like, what can you really do? Um, but yeah, so I would just say in general, I think it's it's not great. Um, the, the whole idea here about assimilation uh, at Soul Food, we are very much against this. We believe in positive integration, but not in assimilation. And um, unfortunately, France as a whole is still very much focused on that. Who um, um, or, or sort of what countries um, that you're aware of have a better sort of or more progressive or more constructive policy toward, you know, integrating migrants into the, into the system, into the population? I think it's, I don't know if I would look to any one country as being a way better as a whole. I think some countries do some things better. Mm. Um, I know that there are some in some rankings, they rank like some countries. I feel like I just read something about uh, Portugal, for example. They rank some things that happen in some countries as better. But I feel like as a whole, there's a lot that needs to be done in general. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's a that's a difficult situation across the board. So of course, that's you know. There, there is no utopia for for any of these young people, unfortunately. And working within that um, that context, working with you know a, a far less than ideal um, institutionalized you know 
uh, protocol toward toward young migrants. What has been the biggest challenge for you guys in operating um, from the beginning, and 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 sort of how do you personally measure success? Because obviously, this is you know, there have to be sort of I guess for you to feel like you're moving the dial in a positive way. Um, I imagine anyone who does this kind of work needs to see, you know, the the shining moments um, in order to keep going. Um, but what does that look like? Um, so as far as obstacles, there are definitely <laughs> a lot. Um, but I think maybe the biggest one is just the fact that we are still quite small. Uh, so we're still all volunteers. We're trying to change that. Um, but... Uh, for the moment, we are all volunteers, so it means we have jobs, other jobs too, like on the side or, you know, depending on for who I spend most of my time with Soul Food and then I have other jobs on the side for the other co-founder and uh, the other volunteers we work with for the most part, they have, you know, other jobs and Soul Food is kind of on the side. So that just makes it, in, you know, incredibly hard. It just means we're often working seven days a week at night, you know, all of that. So it's not very sustainable. And then we don't have as many resources as we would like, or even as we need to um, really be able to grow, help more young people. Uh, we know that we could do so much more. We've already accomplished, I think, a, a, a decent amount, but we know we could do so much more if we had more resources. So I would say just that in general is the, is the biggest obstacle. We don't have um, like a, a a center like a place either where we can like welcome our young members so we often I mean part of that is part of meeting them all over Paris is it's like it's part of what we do so that's okay but it also means you know sometimes we have to have like serious administrative conversations with our young members sort of on the street while we're waiting right. to enter into a concert you know like it's the working conditions sometimes are kind of insane and then another more obvious one that you know like everyone could probably <laughs> relate to or like understand is is um another young member who we placed uh in one of the best bakeries in Paris um he is our first uh so i guess he started with an internship an apprenticeship and now he's our first uh cd so the first permanent work contract that we've had oh amazing yeah, and he's like I think he's 19 and he showed us um, photos of the house that he's building in Mali for his family with the money that he's been making from this job. And um, yeah, and he told us that, um, you know, for him, this was something he really needed to do for his family. And that after that, he's going to start sort of living more for himself. Um, and he also has dreams of maybe going back to Mali and creating some kind of bakery there. But just the idea that, like, he, you know, he's able to make his dreams come true and even help his family and his community, at least in part because of a job that we helped him um, find, is, uh, is, yeah, is very special. So for us, this was also a huge marker of success. And certainly these kinds of stories should put things into perspective for people. I'm sure the volunteers themselves are, you know, then looking at their connection and approach to work and, and, and how they value, you know, the activities they're involved in. Because, you know, when you, when you compare that to people who really just want to support their families and their communities and, and are, are going through all of this for, you know, very noble reasons, very important, you know, reasons for for survival and for you know sustaining a family i mean certainly puts things into perspective and and so i can already anticipate people are going to want to know how can they help you if our listeners want to support soul food and and sort of you know if they can't come and volunteer because obviously they're not all based in france what you know do you have a sort of fundraising arm what yeah. can help so we on our website um we so we have a, a basic donation page so people can make donations, uh, whether it's a one-time donation or even um, small monthly donations are incredibly helpful um, because that really helps us to have, uh, you know, visibility and to be able to plan and understand um, each month what we have coming in. Um, we also uh, created um, a line of like ethical merch to raise uh, money for soul food. So on our website, you can also buy merch and we work with artists as well. Um, so we're selling some prints and uh, most, if 
not all, depending on the artist, uh, the proceeds go to soul food. So those are two ways that people who don't uh, live here in Paris can help. And then also we are creating more and more um, cultural events uh, for the community. And so this is a really great way for people who do live here or who are able to travel here can really um, kind of come into our universe and learn more about what we do. Uh, often the young members are involved with everything from creating the menu to working with the chefs. We work with a lot of different amazing chefs um, from different countries. Uh, usually we, we always love to have different forms of art present. We like to really mix different kinds of people as well. So our events are always quite diverse. Uh, there's always music playing, whether it's one of the playlists that we make for the event or with DJs or live music. Um, sometimes we also do like art workshops during the events. So that's another way that people can mm. um, can come and participate and support us. And when we do those events, the profits, they also come back into Soul Food. So um, that's always super uh, useful. You know, <laughs> social media engagement, that helps us a lot too. Absolutely. Visibility is also part of the, the mission. Um, you were just at We Love Green, right? Yes. The music festival. <laughs> which separate from being completely rained out by a deluge, um, is that sort of one of the kinds of events that you mean that has, you know, opens up the organization to all sorts of people who, you know, wouldn't necessarily have found you or sought you out, but because you're there and you're, I imagine you're serving yeah. food. Yeah. You're serving food there. Yeah, so yeah. for We Love Green, we had a food truck uh, in collaboration with um, two uh, chefs, uh, Sho and Luis Miguel, one who's um, Cape Verdean and one who's Japanese. And uh, some young members uh, also worked with them. And we had a lot of volunteers who helped us because th this was the biggest thing I think we've undertaken so far. Um, and uh, yeah, so the point of that was to uh, grow our community. So we got to meet a lot of people, also raise money for our nonprofit initiatives. Um, and then as well, we, we use it as an opportunity to kind of go on excursions with our young members. They had never been to a festival like that before. So they worked on the food truck, but they also got to go around the festival, see concerts, um, stuff like that. So it was, <laughs> it was quite an experience. Um, but yeah, so we're, we are both creating our own uh, events, but also participating in others like We Love Green. For Fête de la Musique, we'll be uh, at Gumbo Yaya for Gumbo Fest. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's uh, June 21st, if I yeah. remember correctly, for anybody who's going to be listening and in town for, for Fête de la Musique. That's great. I mean, so you do have events, you know, scheduled in advance so people can also look at the programming. Do you, you list this on the um, website we then? We send out emails in our, so you can sign up for our newsletter. It's another thing that you can do to follow what we do. There's a link on our website and also in our Instagram bio. Um, so we send out emails before events, and um, also we're pretty active on social media. So if you follow us on Instagram mm -hmm. or Facebook in particular, um, you will definitely see when we are going to um, host or even just participate in events. Well, everybody who's listening, uh, if there's any way you can support Soul Food, please do. And obviously, if you have other ideas, whether it's council or you know, you're involved in other nonprofit work and I'm sure you'd be open to maybe discussing with anybody who, who wants to help further this cause. Cassandra, thank you so much. This is such an important initiative and I hope France wakes up to to its shortcomings and and, and tries to make this a, a, a more welcoming place for people. Yeah, but I do too. I, I definitely do too. There's a lot to offer here. It's a very beautiful country. Paris is a very beautiful city. So it would be great if uh, we were all made to feel more welcome here. For From sure. your mouth to the universe. <laughs> Cassandra, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with you. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time. 
Adiento.